Hello, MatPat. I am available to analyze your balls, if you wish. Whoa, that's the tiniest balls I've ever seen. Hey, MatPat. You want me to check out your mom's butt? Overall, your mom's butt is pretty decent. Hi, Matt Pat. Let's take a look at your ego, shall we? Your ego is gigantic, the largest I've ever seen. I really gotta take my Pokemon naming more seriously. Welcome to Game Theory, where I just flew back from Japan, and boy are my arms tired. Get it? Because I had to carry my luggage and it was all really heavy? Basically, I was there for about two weeks working on a top secret project that's going to be on this channel for all you guys. So I'm really excited to share that one with you. That's coming up in December, though, so more on that later. But while I was there, I also made sure to work on one other thing, my Pokedex. Yep, after months of lying dormant, I fired up Pokemon Go again. Remember the four weeks earlier this year when that was still a thing? Anyway, between me wandering around Shibuya looking for region-specific Farfetch'd, the announcement that Gen 2 will be added to the game in December, and the fact that two new Pokemon games literally just released, I figured it was a great time to revisit the small little mobile app that caused the US to walk an extra 144 billion steps this summer. And while the game continues to do good work around the world, literally spawning Lapras and tsunami damaged Japanese communities in order to jumpstart their economies, today we're covering the lore of this game. That's right, I said the lore. Because when you look at the evidence, Pokemon Go, whether in intentionally or not, may just hold the key to answering one of Pokemon's longest held mysteries. One that has lingered in chat rooms, Reddit posts, and many a YouTube theory video since the very first game. No joke. Warm up those Poke thumbs, cause today we're going back into the world of Pokemon Go. So obviously Pokemon Go is a bit rudimentary. You can't weaken Pokemon to catch them, you can't battle to level up. Heck, there isn't even a complete batch of 150 Pokemon in the game. But what if I told you that all of that is intentional? That it's because Go is the first game in the Pokemon timeline. This is actually an idea that was first created by a Japanese Twitter user named at Inc underscore Virtue, and once I started to dig a bit deeper, puzzle pieces all started to fit together. First, although there may not be 150 available right now, let's look at the Pokemon that you can catch in the game. The ones that are alive and well and walking about the world around you. You can see all the usual suspects, your typical Rattatas, Pidgeys, and so many, so many damn Nidorans hovering around awkwardly in augmented reality land just waiting around for your capture ball. But then you have Pokemon like Omanyte and Omastar, Kabuto and Kabutops. Pokemon that, by generation one, are all extinct. Only able to be added to your Pokedex by reviving ancient fossils. And yet in Go, they're just wandering around, alive and well. If we assume that Go does possess a lore that ties in with a larger Pokeverse, that would mean that Go is set before Gen 1. So that's pretty weird, but it gets even better. Who isn't in the game from the original set of 151? Articuno, Zapdos, Moltres, Mew, and Mewtwo, obviously, but they're all legendary, so no big surprises there. But that still leaves one curious gap in the Pokedex. Ditto. Because I looked into it, and for all the recent rumors that he's region-specific to Africa and all that, it simply isn't true based on the evidence that I can tell. All the images that have been posted online have been largely debunked as photoshopped. So then that begs the question, why out of all all the Pokemon is Ditto missing from the roster. He's the only one, the only one who's not a legendary. Well, consider the following. A popular theory circulating the internet a few years ago was that the Pokemon Ditto was created in attempts to clone Mew. Come to think of it, why did I never cover that one? Curse you missed opportunities! Well, since I've never fully covered it, let me just run through some of the major evidence right now in a quick mini theory. Let's call it a theory light. No, no, better! Diet theory. So both Ditto and Mew weigh 8.8 .8 pounds or 4 kilograms. It's an odd coincidence, right? Well, odder still is that they're both genderless and the fact that they have the same ability, learning transform naturally at level zero. People around that time also said that their coloring is similar, but it's definitely not one of the stronger points to the theory. What is a strong point of evidence, though, is that in Pokemon Yellow, there are two places where Ditto can be caught, the Pokemon Mansion and Cerulean Cave. The first is the location where Mewtwo was cloned from Mew. The second 
second is where Mewtwo actually lives. So obviously, we see that Ditto and Mewtwo share an odd connection, something that takes on even greater meaning when noting that Mewtwo is always described as, quote, the only successful clone of Mew, i.e. that there were several other failed attempts. Could those failed attempts be Ditto? Well, honestly, if I were to assess this theory, yeah, probably. Just think about their abilities. Ditto can copy any Pokemon and perform their moves. Mew just so happens to have the DNA of all Pokemon within it and can learn any move. But hey, that's just a theory. A diet theory. Thanks for listening to that brief summary of the evidence. So now let's go back to the main theory about Pokemon Go. The fact that Ditto isn't in the game points to the idea that this is a game happening before the cloning experiment goes awry. In fact, Mewtwo being absent from the game supports it as well. He's not in the game because he doesn't exist yet. Just like the Omanites and Kabutos not being extinct yet, Go takes place at a time before Mew was attempted to be cloned, hence the reason both Mewtwo and Ditto are absent. Boom! Mind blown. Alright, so the available roster of Pokemon seems to line up, but that's not all. The rudimentary gameplay also factors in quite nicely. You hurl balls to catch Pokemon that you stumble across in the wild, just having to hope that your skill in tossing is enough to lock in that polywag you've been eager for. There's no battling to weaken them. Maybe you use a raspberry to help your odds, but that's about it. Does that remind you of anything? I don't know about you, but to me, I immediately think of the Safari Zones. Parks built as nature preserves, protecting the earlier days of Pokemon catching, where again, trainers are restricted to just throwing balls and not actually engaging in battle. They even have step limits. Could they be a potential callback to a simpler time when learning to be a trainer wasn't so formalized, i.e. the period of Pokemon Go? And speaking of training, all of this would also explain why you can't teach your Pokemon on new moves. TMs and HMs just aren't a thing. They haven't been created yet. The lack of formal trainers is also why the gym structure is so rudimentary, and why there are no badges. It's still a new concept in development. But perhaps most interestingly of all is the leveling system. In the game, you don't battle to gain levels, you do it by feeding your Pokemon candy. Shove enough bit of honeys down your Squirtle's gullet and you're gonna get a war turtle come hell or high water. Sounds a lot like rare candy from the main games, no? Where giving your Pokemon a candy causes them to level up. But one thing we've never stopped to consider is the actual actual name of that item. Rare candy. It's a very specific word choice. What made them rare in the first place? If it's such a useful thing for trainers, why not mass produce the stuff? Well, think about what the candy's made out of. Other Pokemon. It's a joke everyone's made. When you transfer your hundredth Rattata to create candy, I mean, let's face it, that Rattata's going to the professor's meat grinder. I mean, the candies are species-specific and everything. So what if what made them rare was a movement among the people of the Pokemon world protesting the inhumanity of this practice? Sure, it was a fast way to gain levels, but it was deemed too cruel, and so candies started to disappear, leading them to become, say it with me now, rare. That would also explain why rare candy isn't sold in stores in the main series games. It always has to be found lying on the ground somewhere. You know that someone would want to make a profit off of those things, and some market somewhere would sell them, but nope, no store owner touches them, meaning that there must be some sort of ban against selling these sorts of things. That's why I don't think it's a more common explanation like overuse causing the supply to plummet. Even if they were overused, they would still be sold in stores. So anyway, if Pokemon Go were the origin story, we see the beginnings of candy, and then by the time the main series rolls around, it's become outlawed, and is thus rare. And if you think me analyzing the declining supply of an in-game item is thinking too far into all this, well think again. We can actually see it happen with the other major item from Pokemon Go, Raspberries. So in Pokemon Go, once you cross level 8, you get access to this special item at Pokestops. And they drop fairly regularly. They're not rare by any means. And across Gen 3 and Gen 4, they're still around, but now fast forward to Generation 5 and 6, which are confirmed as the latest dates in the Pokemon timeline. Now, all of a sudden, the item description descriptions talk about how rare these items are. Interesting, no? Even the items in these games maintain a sense of lore, and that lore points to Pokemon Go being the predecessor to everything that we've played since. But if the list of Pokemon available, evolutions in gameplay, and decline of items isn't enough to convince you, here's the kicker. The first person that we meet in Pokemon Go is Professor Willow, our guide through all things Pokemon. If this is indeed the first game in the series with serious ties to the main franchise, then 
presumably we should see this guy again, right? Well, what if I told you that we do? In Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal, he's none other than Gym Leader Price. Now that may initially seem like a stretch, but stay with me here. First, look at their posture and hair color. Both are holding their Pokeballs in a very similar way, and both have white hair. But Price is old and has gray hair, I hear you saying, and yeah, you're right, that's absolutely correct. That could very well be the explanation. But also, someone with white hair who grows old would also keep his white hair into old age. You can't just rule it out. They also both have a fondness for an outer coat with a popped collar. So the designs share similarities, sure, but obviously that's all circumstantial evidence. We need something more solid. Well, in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, when his last Pokemon is in critical condition, Price will say the following. Quote, Willow is my middle name. Willow is flexible and not easily broken. I'm not giving up yet. End quote. What a weird detail. If you call him later in the game, he also brings it up again in phone calls. Is it a coincidence that these two share not only a similar pose, but also the same name? And it's not just any name, mind you, it's a tree name, which means a whole heck of a lot when you consider that, to my knowledge, anyone with a tree name in the Pokeverse is, or at least has been, a professor. It's kind of like the expectation that anyone named Jeeves is eventually going to become a butler. Obviously, the exception to this rule is Ash, but that's the anime, and the anime has questionable canonicity and it's not like he grows older anyway, who knows, he might grow up to become a professor, etc, etc, etc. To me, at least, I like the story that this theory creates. But at the beginning of the episode, I mentioned that if this is indeed true, then Go might answer one of Pokemon's longest-held mysteries. And that, my friends, is the origin of the Great Pokemon War. Ever since Generation 1, the internet has speculated about a mysterious Pokemon War alluded to by Lieutenant Surge during your gym battle with him. I propose to you that this war is one caused by disagreements between Team Mystic, Team Valor, and Team Instinct about the proper role and use of Pokemon. Get this, we know that the war has to take place in Lieutenant Surge's lifetime, so it's within 40 years of Generation 1. This guy is no AZ living for 3,000 years or anything. That also means it has to come after the creation of the first Pokeballs, as, according to the game's lore, modern Pokeballs were first developed back in 1925 by Professor Westwood. And what do we have in Pokemon Go? Well, for all the rudimentary game mechanics, we do have one modern idea, and that is balls modern balls. And yet, by the start of Generation 1, Team Mystic, Valor, and Instinct are no more. No one even mentions them. Also, we see in Go that Willow is in his late 20s, early 30s-ish, which would place him around Price's age by the time the events of Silver and Gold would roll around. Price even mentions having to go through hardships in his life. In the anime, that's losing his Pylo swine, but in the games, he's older than Surge, meaning he must have gone through the same war that Surge did. But most of all, look at the Pokemon created prior to the start of Generation 1. First Porygon, and then Mewtwo. It's actually confirmed by the official Bulbapedia timeline that Porygon came first, and then years later Mewtwo showed up. Both are artificial Pokemon, created via programming, in Porygon's case, or cloning, in Mewtwo's. Decisions that I guarantee are gonna be pretty controversial to people. Artificially creating life? Nuh-uh! That's gonna make some people very, very very upset. And in Pokemon Go, we have a Porygon, but not a Ditto or a Mewtwo, meaning that this slots right in that sweet spot from the timeline where one exists and the other one doesn't. Thus, I propose that Pokemon Go not only connects to the main franchise games, but tells the story of the start of Lieutenant Surge's mysterious Pokemon War, one fought between Valor, Mystic, and Instinct over the creation and use of man-made Pokemon, a war that was either prompted by the creation of Mewtwo or ended by the creation of Mewtwo. In the end, Mystic and Instinct team up to win against Valor, hence having a society dominated by professors studying Pokemon in the wild and battling being relegated to formal competitions regulated by the Pokemon League by the time Gen 1 rolls around. Is it a stretch? Am I overthinking a really simple mobile app that was created by people who didn't fully understand the mechanics of the game? Yeah. Probably, but personally, I like this one a lot, because it fits together a lot of pieces for a mystery I think the creators of the Pokeverse forgot a long time ago. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. And thus we bring in the age of a new war. A war in the comments debating the validity of this theory. I look forward to seeing who the winner is. 
So now that you know the hidden lore within Pokemon Go, I have one more question. What are you gonna do while playing Pokemon Go? Cause let's face it, the game doesn't have the most compelling of soundtracks. Well how about listening to an audiobook instead? Perhaps the Pokemon Go Gamer Tips Guide, now available on audible.com. Yeah, that's right, Audible has Pokemon Go related books already. That is called being relevant. So now, while you're standing in the middle of Target's parking lot at 3am, blindly wandering in circles hoping for a Dragonite to spawn, you could be rocking out to the ultimate history of gaming from Pong to Pokemon. While you're burning through the last of your free Pokeballs and security is asking you to leave the premises, tell him you're catching them all. All the audiobooks, original audio shows, news and comedy, and Audible's unmatched library of content, that is. And when he keeps bugging you to leave, tell him to back off since you're exercising your rights as a private US citizen, facts that you'll have learned from listening to Rogue Justice, the making of the security state, another of Audible's great titles. And after Pokemon Go blindly sends you tumbling off a cliff in pursuit of that rogue pincer, you can see if you were included in this latest report about the craziest Pokemon Go injuries, also available for you to listen to right here on Audible.com. And then you'll be able to sleep tight in your hospital bed as that ghastly hovers ominously over your feet, knowing that those medical bills won't be so bad because you signed up for a free trial of Audible, which is 30 days absolutely free. Just make sure that you're putting that money you save towards that cast on your leg, little Jimmy. Just use the code audible.com slash matpat, audible.com slash m-a-t-p-a-t to become the Pokemon trainer you always dreamed you could be. Or just click the link in the description. And as one final note, in case you were wondering the results of the Super Amazing End Card Tournament, for FNAF, the overall number one favorite animatronic of all time is the duo combination of Foxy and Mangle, with an overwhelming majority, twice that, of the next most popular animatronic, Baby. Behind those guys was Golden Freddy, and then Springtrap. And rounding out the rear is Chica, just like the fan fictions would have demanded it. Anyway, that's it for today. Next week, something not animal related, not animatronic related, just something different. All right, see you then.